and welcome to worship at the Presbyterian Church in Westfield. We're so glad that you've joined us today for worship, uh, wherever you may be, you're a part of this worshiping community. Today is our last day in our worship series on the four pillars of our church, worship, learning, connecting, and serving. Today, we will examine how living our faith out through acts of service helps us to be closer to each other and closer to God. Let us worship God together. I see the state of the world and it grieves me. I hear the cries of the broken from the rich and the poor. Smell the fear of disease all around me. I feel responsible now that I've seen because we all to live for more than this, more than this. So I want to love like you love, love like you love. Want to love others the way that you love me. I want to love.
You know, friends, I knew a guy in Atlanta who had been, uh, he was the managing partner of a, a huge international firm. Uh, it's at least 1,200 or more attorneys. Uh, they are all over the globe. They have offices, uh, their main offices are in Atlanta, but they're all over the place. Now, his specialization was as a trial attorney in commercial litigation. I know it's really exciting stuff, but he often represented big four accounting firms and he was any of the Fortune 500 companies, et cetera. But when he retired, as much of a big shot as he had been in helping you know, to guide and decide legal cases in, in, in business, he did something that, it wasn't a 180, but just so completely different. When he retired, I'm gonna call him Jay because I don't have his permission to use his full story, so I'm taking away all the you know, names of places of where he was, but Jay did something really remarkable. He began representing inmates who had been uh, potentially wrongfully imprisoned. Now, Jay was a lifelong Presbyterian. He attended Sunday school from a young age right on through his career. He was steeped in a sense that his faith guided or should guide his interactions with the entire world. Who God is shaped the way that Jay saw the world. Now, our scripture today links our worship life directly to God's providence and care for the suffering. It sets the stage for us, like Jay, to join in with what God is already up to in the world. So this is Psalm 113. Praise the Lord. Praise, O servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time on and evermore, from the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. The Lord is high above all nations and his glory above the heavens. Who is like the Lord our God who is seated on high, who looks far down on the heavens and the earth? He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes, with the princes of his people. He gives the barren woman a home, making her the joyous mother of children. Praise the Lord. So this is the word of our Lord, okay? That is the scripture setting for today. And there are three things that leap out at me right off the bat in this psalm. Before we get into the history and the use of the psalm, there are a handful of things I really want us to key in on uh, right now. Or actually, you know what? I'm, I want to, you know, one of them is actually something we'll get to with the history. I want to focus really on just two things right now. It, it talks about who God is in like really specific terms. And number two, when we start talking about suffering, it uses imagery of those who have been thrust or, or thrown to the margins of society as examples of who God lifts up. Sorry, so that's two. And there's two parts of that, really, right? There's specifically the poor and the needy, and then there's those who are infertile, the barren. Well, there's this, uh, um, there's this monk out, in, uh, out west in the, in the United States uh, named Father Conrad Schaefer. And when he speaks about this psalm, and uh, in a write-up that he did, he says that Psalm 113 shows that majesty, the majesty of God, right? That majesty is manifest in mercy. I think we'll find a pattern today that just about everyone who reviews this psalm talks about God stooping down to lift us up. The majesty of God is manifest in God's mercy. So let's start right at the beginning. You know, the name of the Lord is uttered six different times all in a row, each time with some sort of a call for praise, right? Even to the ends of the earth, we're told. And it all culminates with the seventh uttering of God's name, the, the seventh holy time, right? And that seventh time, the name of the Lord is mentioned this time as a question. And I think it's a question upon which the entire rest of the psalm hinges or rests. The question is, who is like the Lord our God? Well, the, the answer is, is easy. It, it, no one is, right? I mean, no one. And then Charles Spurgeon, who was a 19th century uh, professor and, and a preacher in England, 
Now, he almost jokes about this question, and yet, you know, we're still invited to be more like God, right? I mean, yes, no one is like God, but we're invited to be more like God. At least those of us who profess a desire for relationship with the divine, uh, a, a desire to follow Christ, and those of us who answer the call or try to, to be a part of God's people. For those of us who check any of those boxes, we are called to be more godlike, to be more like God. And if we follow the logic of Psalm 113, we're called to be more merciful in the world and to our neighbors and those we encounter. Now, it'd be really easy right now for us just to skip to the answer portion of this whole talk, but I want us to stay for just a little bit longer with Psalm 113 and learn more of why it's such an important psalm at both a historical level and a liturgical one. So liturgical, meaning having to do with worship in our life. So Charles Spurgeon, I mentioned just a moment ago, he called Psalm 113 the commencement of the Hallel. Simply put, this psalm is the first in a cycle of six different psalms from 113 through 118 that make up what is classically known as the Hallel. Now, these are ancient songs that were read and sung as part of all the major celebrations and joyful festivals from early Judaism right to the present. And we can think of these as being sung at you know, events like uh, Hanukkah, uh, Passover, the Festival of the Tabernacles. And Psalm 113 is the beginning of all of it. It is a song that is, was sung or is sung at Passover to really underscore how the lowly, the barren, the bereft Zion, the, the, the people of Israel, were lifted from the poverty of slavery in Egypt. Even Jesus and his followers, they would have sung Psalm 113 as their first act of worship during the Last Supper. I've mentioned Charles Spurgeon a couple times, and I, I, I'm doing that in part because in, in reading his work, I've been so surprised at what he has to say. He has this quote that I want to share with you about praise, and he says it's specific to the psalm, but it stuck with me the last several days. He's, he's speaking specifically of praise, but he says, Praise is an essential offering at all solemn feasts of the people of God. Prayer is the myrrh, and praise is the frankincense, and both of these must be presented to the Lord. Uh, I think the reason why that has stuck with me is that for probably too long, I've kind of taken it for granted that, you know, elements like myrrh and frankincense, these worship elements like that, are so much a part of a past or of traditions that are alien to my own. And he really gets down to a visceral place to say these, these symbols that carry so much weight and so much uh, meaning at a ritual level or the smells of them are heady, and they, they, they pull us to a spiritual place. They are prayer and praise. And for those of us in our era, every act of praise is this priestly offering of committing something or leaving something with and in God's hands. The praise is the frankincense, that, that moment of which the very Spirit of God starts to be recognized. These are beautiful things, and, and I love what he's, what he's doing there. And he's speaking about Psalm 113 when he makes that little aside. The psalm, Psalm 113, starts with this call to worship and praise of God. This is a God who is majestic in their mercy. This is really where we get to the people of God, and we're asking them to pay attention. This whole statement, this, this call to worship, leads to what the whole meaning of life is for us who would try to follow. The central question at the heart of the psalm is, who is like the Lord our God? I mentioned him before, but Conrad Schaefer, this, this Catholic monk, he says that despite God being utterly different, utterly distant from creation, 
the divine is still inclined to it. He says, God is transcendent in essence and eminent in interest. And Schaefer calls this God's self-abasement or God's self-lowering, that God who is above all chooses to be amongst us. Well, this is very similar to what the Reformed theologian uh, Karl Barth, who is a, he resisted the Nazis, he, he was an important thinker that, that shaped most of the last almost hundred years of Christian thought, right? He called that same idea, what, what Schaefer calls God's self-abasement, Karl Barth called the condescension of God, the choosing to be descended with us. And in Barth's theology, this is a central theme of who God is and how God works in creation. God bends down low in order to lift up the suffering. For example, in John's gospel, we hear at the very beginning in chapter one how God saw fit to come and dwell among us in this person, Jesus Christ. And in Psalm 113, we hear of God's self-abasement, right, self self-condescension, and that it has consequences of raising up the poor and the needy. God came in John's gospel, according to John's gospel, to come and be amongst us, to, to reconcile with us, to make all things right. And in Psalm 113, we get the predecessor of this. We get God choosing from on high to come down low. And we, when we look at who God is concerned with, right? We get the poor, we get the needy, we get then this very short little spin of this barren woman or these barren women. And James Mays, who is a, a, an Old Testament uh, professor a long time ago at Union Theological Seminary down in Richmond, when he looked at this same phrase from the psalm, he said that when we look at like a larger society, the underclass of the poor and weak are now raised to rank with the preeminent of the upper classes. He goes on to include those who struggle to have children. He says, in the nuclear unit of the larger family, the wife who has like zero status because she's barren is made joyous and the mother of children, she has a home. And if we zero in for a moment on each of these two groups, we find a slightly different focus and a slightly different meaning for us today. So those who have been perennially tossed to the very margins of society, the poor, right? They are made equal to those of means. The Pew Bible that we usually use at, at PCW speaks of the poor of the dust and the needy of the ash heap. Well, it's ironic because the way that's translated is actually different from the Hebrew. The usually less accurate King James Version actually mirrors the Hebrew in this particular case. There's a word called ashpof, in, and that's, I'm butchering it, trust me, uh, in Hebrew. And it, the word means dunghill. What gets trans, you know, translated as ash heap in our normal pew Bible at PCW can also be read as the needy on the dung heap, on the dung hill. Now, I know it's indelicate, but Scripture, Psalm 113, speaks of God leaving the heavens and lifting the needy right out of the literal gutters. God lifts, in this almost the next, or literally in the next statement, God lifts the barren woman. And now we get... These images of songs like Hannah's Prayer and Mary's Magnificat, right? Coming to mind is God is watchful of women whom society has cast to the margins. For women of that era, of that time, and with echoes, frankly, to this one, women were defined by their household. And in fact, in ancient Israel, a woman could not have a home until she had kids. Infertility was a source of shame, but it also meant that these women were ridiculed, they were abandoned, they were left to chance. It was dangerous. Psalm 113 
reminds us that the, the beauty of who God is is wrapped up in God's mercy. God takes what is broken and makes it whole again. So who is like the Lord our God? Well, no one. God who resides in highest heaven, who is above all, is still deeply concerned with everything that occurs in our world and takes a special interest in those who continue to be tossed aside as less than, those who, whose value to society has somehow been diminished. And I think this is where we are called to nowadays, right here, right now, to meet this psalm. We're called to praise the God who raised up Israel from bondage, who continues to stoop down and, and lift up the poor and the needy. And we're called to participate. Now, earlier, before we encountered the psalm itself, I mentioned this, this you know, person I knew in Atlantic named Jay, who works in his retirement with the Southern, Senator, uh, Southern Center for Human Rights, and he defends inmates who have been wrongfully imprisoned. I, I believe that everyone who professes our faith is called to some form of service in the world, some practice of mission work. And I've mentioned in certain circles, and even preached at, at times, that I believe mission to be a core element of our faith. And that sometimes we Christians get a little, let's just say sideways in our approach or, or, or what guides us in our mission work. Some traditions see mission as a way to simply uh, convert other people. Sometimes even when that's not the picture, we inadvertently can start thinking of this work, service, and serving others as how we and our comfort can help those poor people. Now, here's the deal. God may stoop down from on high to lift us up, but that is never our work. We don't come from that on high position ever. I cannot stoop to raise another human, and neither can you. We are called to join in God's work, but never from an elevated place. Now, the term pity is really a troubling one. To take pity on someone almost always comes from a position of higher stature or of an elevated place. It depends on seeing someone or some circumstance from above, that poor person. We are not called in service or mission to work from a place of pity, but rather a place of empathy, a place of compassion depend, that depends on us having known and, and have felt pain. We are now able to see it in someone else and feel responsible to be with them. The poor and the needy are common folks whom the church have endeavored to help. And economic suffering is just so, it's just, it's tangible. It's easy to see and in some ways, it's the easiest to try to participate with. But I want to encourage us right now to look beyond the economic dunghills of Psalm 113 to other forms of suffering where we could and perhaps even should be paying attention to. My question is, what modern social poverty weighs on us today just in the same way that infertility did for, for ancient women? I mean, one Back then, one could lose everything for the sake of infertility. But nowadays, it could be depression, a, a mental illness, certainly imprisonment, addiction. Spiritual poverty, spiritual pains. They run rampant in our society today, and people are hurting. People need to be made whole once more. And so as we leave this series on the pillars of our church, the, the pillars on which our faith tends to stand, I leave you with a homework assignment. If we are called as 
people who would try to follow Christ, if we are called to join in the work of mercy that we see in God, then what form may that take for you? I mean, you personally. So Jay from Atlanta, he defends those without the means to defend themselves. He's trying to right wrongs. Whom may God be calling you to serve as a source of wholeness in the midst of so much that is broken? That is your homework. I ask you to pray about it. Through the eyes of men it seems there's so much we have lost As we look down the road where all the prodigals have walked And one by one the enemy has whispered lies and led them off as slaves mm -hmm. But we know that you are God
Friends, as we have heard God's word and as we have come to the end of our worship series, as we've looked at the pillars of PCW, worship, learn, connect, and ending on serve and service and how when we serve one another and with God, all things are possible. And in that same vein, we must go to God in prayer and when we do anything in the life of the church. And so, friends, join with me as we pray. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, three in one mysterious triune God, who is always with us, who is always for us, who is always advocating beside us, who is always within us cultivating wonder. We come before you with great joy and with excitement and hope. We also come to you with questions and doubts. We also come to you depraved, despondent, hopeless, sad, concerned, and worried. We also come to you eager to hear your strong yet still voice, speaking words of truth and power in our lives. God, we come to you with all things. We come knowing and expecting that you speak to us in all situations and in all facets of our life. And we humbly come before you with all of the concerns in our life for those who are sick, for the dying, for those who are hungry and thirsty, for those who are homeless, for those who are lost, for those who are addicted, for the caregivers, for all of the situations in our world and in our heart that cause us pain and worry. We know we can come to you with all things. We know that you are with us, supporting us, and in a way, serving with us. God, we also come to you with the hopes and dreams that are so deep within us and in our heart that we long to see in this world for restoration, for unity, for reconciliation, for hope, for all people to know that they belong for everyone in this world to have safe spaces to worship, learn, connect, and serve. For all to know you and then to be known. God, we also come to you with so much joy in our hearts for all of the things that are so wonderful, for the flowers that are blooming, for the children laughing, for the sun shining, for relationships that are being restored, for new discoveries about oneself, for love experienced, for hope that is realized. God, we are thankful and we know that we can bring all things to you. And so God, as we come to you, we ask that you would so embolden us to serve alongside of you, to serve your people. And by serving your people, knowing your people, loving your people, being a neighbor to your people, and God, help us to serve not only those who we know, 
But the people who often go unknown help us to serve the people who it's sometimes hard to serve. Help us to serve the communities and your creation that seem to be unrepairable. Help us to serve with you and in doing so, serving you. And God, we ask that your Holy Spirit would be with us, empowering us and cultivating a sense of courage and boldness in our hearts and minds. And as we're on our way, we go knowing and trusting that you are with us. And on that journey, we ask that you would continue to empower us, continue to give us reminders of why we do what we do, and help us to always be humble enough to pivot away from something to something new that you're doing in our life. We ask this all humbly yet boldly in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray, praying together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Now, friends, starting next week, we have something new for you. PCW will officially, in our next series of videos, everything that will come out, we're moving for an entirely new direction for digital worship, video worship. We're gonna be keeping all the same platforms, but in order to, number one, have more staff resources spent on education videos and other programming for you, and number two, in order to help provide more worship options for you at home, we're doing something different. Instead of preparing a, a video uh, production like we have been the last few years, we're gonna to move to live streaming. And we're gonna be live streaming both of our on-site, in-person worship experiences. One is a more traditional form of, of Presbyterian uh, worship that's held in our sanctuary. The other is a contemporary setting of worship that we, that we do also on-site at the same time. And we invite you to join along with whichever or both you tend to enjoy. Because you're gonna have the option to participate in either one of those two services on whatever platform you're already using. Now, at first, the experience uh, will simply be a live feed of whatever is record, you know, the, of whatever is going on. And that live feed will go to uh, all of our platforms and then be recorded and made available later, again, on all platforms. So that people who prefer uh, worshiping with us whenever during the week, they'll still be able to. But over time, instead of it just being a lot, uh, that feed of just whatever is happening, we anticipate being able to bring other videos to bear during the service uh, and new elements that you've come to expect over the last few years in our current uh, you know, way of doing video. We're excited to bring you this new offering and to make it easier for everyone who joins us digitally to have a little bit more idea of what we do here in person. Now until then, until you start to experience this yourself, I want you to continue with your homework and I want you to know that you are loved far more than you could ever hope or imagine and be at peace, my friends. Until then.
that's all folks.